tests are usually only for the purpose, purpose of biomining. Now, I disagree with that. If I would have had that at the time, since benzene's only metabolized in 12 hours, putting it together with symptomatology and maybe changes of anemia and the leukemia cases that we've seen in the community or the aplastic anemias are now the four multiple myeloma cases that I'm aware of, it could have helped. Just my opinion. So we looked at phase one of the trials, 52 patients, 31 females, 21 males, age distribution 11 to 80. Cough, 79%, greater than four weeks, headaches, 77%, nosebleeds, 34, dizziness, 28, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, 23%, eye irritation, 13, rash, 12, other symptoms, tingling of hands, forgetfulness on focus, dry mouth, laryngitis, change of voice, <coughs> upper airway congestion, and interesting a joint and body pain. Phase two of the study started in January of 2017. We looked at 72, or I looked at 72 patients. 51 females, 21 males, age distribution, 13 to 91. Compared the first symptoms to the second symptoms of the headaches from phase one to phase two, 60% to 77%. Fatigue was new now, 55%, no doubt at 51. Cough, 51% to 79%. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and nosebleeds are about the same. This is one year later, health problems still existed. Other symptoms, rash, laryngitis, sore throat, sinus symptoms, memory loss, depression, hair loss, body pains, palpitation, vertigo, and insomnia. Then, because you guys asked and kept pushing and pushing and pushing, I said, okay, you wanna do toxicology, so we did toxicology. So we did urine sample for VOC. A VOC is a volatile organic compound. What does that mean? That means if I took this bottle and did find this as a volatile organic compound, I'd open up the top of it and it would go away. It wants to be a gas and it would go away into the environment. Semi-volatile compound wants to go away a little slower, okay? So we tested for VOCs in the urine and we tested hair samples for metals. Went outside of California, why? Because there was already a trust problem with the agencies here. So I went to Kansas City, Kansas. I flew there myself, I interviewed the doctors, I looked at the lab, and I walked through the lab. There was no political bias. I wanted to make sure that they had no contracts with the state of California to do any amount of work. The two doctors there just point out, both PhDs, Dr. Shaw worked at the CDC, <clears throat> Dr. Matt Pratt was trained in cellular molecular biology from the University of Michigan. Uh, and this doctor of Curtis Klassen uh, spoke with him in Germany. He is the father of toxicology, or one of them. Very, very knowledgeable, well-trained, ethical people. Moved ahead, did the study, and at the end of the study, got them to do a testimony. The anomalies of certain chemicals found in the samples were significant. This is their testimony. This group was uniquely different than other similar testings we have done, therefore we strongly suggest further investigations into this findings. So let's go through what we found. First of all, so you understand, what does it do when you find something in someone's urine? It's usually not the chemical that you're concerned with, it's the metabolite. So you either ingest it or get it on the skin or combo or inhale it. It goes to the liver, it gets changed. It gets changed into a chemical, it's dumped into the blood, it goes to the kidney, you urinate it, they collect it, they put it in a machine and they do all kinds of magic, and bingo, they come out with a level of a chemical. Magic. We tested 106 patients, 70 females, 36 males, age distribution from three to 79. What, we're, what we found in the urine, you know about BTEX, correct? No. no. Okay, BTEX is a chemical used in fracking. <clears throat> it's basically four chemicals, which we'll explain going to the first one, which is the E is ethyl benzene in the BTEX. So it's benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylenes, and the metabolite of it is phenyl glycol oxalic acid. If you say that three times, you get a PhD. <laughs> so the styrene and ethyl benzene, when it's ingested, goes to the liver. We'll refer to it now as PGO, and it goes to the urine. 
They did the analysis and they compared California to Porter Ranch. Now, let's talk about a p-value. P-value of 0 0.05, you're taking two groups to compare. And you want to see if there's a significant difference between the two groups. So a large number greater than 0 0.05 is not statistically significant. Anything less than that is. What was the level of these two comparisons? 0 0.0005. You were significantly different in Porter Ranch than California. The groups were chose by Kansas City. Kansas City does this testing all over the world. It's not just a little mom and pop in Kansas City, click your heels three times and you can get home. They test all over the world. We talked about that, <clears throat> moving on. Did we find benzene? No, we didn't. I, didn't have, I never expected, we were 14 months past the repair. It's metabolized in 12 hours. We did not find any evidence of the metabolites of benzene. So then we looked at the hair samples. We looked at the anatomy of the hair first, and a lot of people say, well, hair sample has got no validity, and it's interesting because since the FBI uses hair samples for drug abuse, uh, the Department of Transportation uses it because if it's positive, they won't let somebody get behind an 18-wheeler and crash the truck. Uh, so it's very valid in testing for drugs of abuse and altered mental status, motor sensory abilities to drive and handle equipment. So it takes approximately two to three months after you ingest a chemical for either ingestion or inhalation or absorption to it for it to show up in the hair follicle. It has to go into the blood in order, as you can see here, you can see, okay, good. So it, it, to go up into the follicle to be uptake into the protein, okay, and then up into the hair shaft of which we measured one half inch proximal here on the hair shaft. The hair shaft grows about a half inch in one month. This is an average and it can change. If you have hypothyroidism, it's gonna go grow slower, so forth and so on. But in an average, that's how it grows. So the findings here, we tested hair samples, 103 patients, 52 females, 41 males age three to 80. What we found in the hair is that 93.5% had uranium. Uranium is, is a metal, lithium is an element. 60% of the population in Porter Ranch had lithium. So let's talk about uranium. Uranium is compared, which we did a comparison. Porter Ranch at a .009, is it statistically significant? The answer is yes. And compared to California, Florida, Missouri, Tennessee, and even spontaneously had pulled from the United States, found that, that these control groups, it was greater. Uranium is very heavy. 238, there's, there's isotopes of uranium, it's too deep for this conversation, but 99% of the uranium exists as 238. <clears throat> it gives off what we call alpha radiation. It's not beta, it's not gamma, it's the least harmful of any of the radiations. And in fact, if you took a rock of uranium 238 and you set it next to your arm, it would not hurt the tissue. If I ground it up and ate it and took it internally, it would damage tissue. But it doesn't, uranium in itself does not cause the major damage. It's not by the alpha radiation, it's actually by the atom itself. Like when you ingest lead, it damages tissue, it damages your bone marrow. Uranium atom damages more so than the alpha effect of the uranium. It's very heavy and it'll settle out and I wanna bring that point up back later. It can be toxic and it does mutate DNA. Accumulates in the bone, liver, kidney, reproductive tissue. It can cause cancer. <clears throat> Increases uh, lung cancer fivefold. This is not an intermission. 
We're going to talk about 7-Up. 7-Up <clears throat> used to be called Bib Label Lithinated Lemon Lime Soda. I don't know if that's a good <laughs> PR marketing <laughs> thing for this or not. I don't know. So 1929 it came out, and guess what it had in it? Lithium. <clears throat> Does anybody know the history of 1929? What happened in 1929? Great Depression. Okay, so what did they put it as? It was a mood enhancing chemical. It was lithium citrate. Is this the same lithium we use now to treat manic depressive disease? Yes. Yeah. It's marketed as a cure for hangover. But it was removed in 7-Up in 1948. I couldn't figure out or find why. Okay, and I also couldn't find out how much was placed in it in the amounts. Lithium, health impacts, nausea, diarrhea, dizziness, muscle weakness, fatigue, days feeling, fine tremor, frequent urination and thirst, weight gain and swelling, thyroid problems. Lithium is well documented in the literature. As we say and apologize and very respectfully so, that it does cause health effects, even though there's no health goal set by the EPA. It's well documented, it affects the kidney, spills over like glucose, that's why it gives you polydipsia polyuria. It makes you want to drink because you urinate a lot. Okay, that's number one. It affects the uptake of the iodine, competes with it for your thyroid, it causes hypothyroidism. So it does have, and it also, if anybody here understands about the depolarization of a nerve, you need sodium and potassium moving through the channels of a nerve. It competes with that, and that's why and how it works for manic depressive syndrome. Affects the central nervous system and affects the peripheral nervous system. That's how it works. Lithium levels found in the hair samples. 0. 0.0004, statistically significant. Yes, Porter Ranch, California, Florida, Missouri, Tennessee, United States. So, now, people have asked me all kinds of questions about, well, why is there so much variability? In fact, somebody just asked me that tonight prior to this conversation. Well, here's some of the answers for that. There's different people that spend different time in the community. People work in their homes. So they might be a 24-7. Kids go to school in the area, do they not? So they're 24-7. There's distribution of gases here. A study was done by, I think, the LA County Public Health. I don't know the results of it. Um, that looked at the wind currents and the concentration. So do, do we think that this gas leak just spread like peanut butter right over the top of the hills and it was all even? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> Baseline health. Pre-existing diagnosis, hypothyroid, migraine headaches, heart disease, hypertension. A lot of people walked into this prior to the, the dumping of, of, of the chemicals. And do we all have the same genetic makeup here? No. Wow. That was easy. <laughs> do you all have the same built homes and construction? Are they all built at the same years? Do you all have the same windows? Your roofing, your north-south orientation of your home, your attached garage, the time the garage was open, the entrance from the garage, the time that you run your HVAC, is that all the same? No. no. So then we said, look, I say we, I got a mouse in my pocket or something, but I said, look, how long has this been going on? I don't know, but it kind of dawned on me, like a tree, you cut a tree, you get rings of the tree, you can tell the age of the tree. Well, heck, why don't we look at how long the hair is. The hair growth should tell us something. So I presented it to all of the people back in Chicago that actually run the assay and Kansas City, and they said, you know, that's not a bad idea. Let's take a look at that. So we got some volunteers, and we ran this. <clears throat> so we looked at the hair sample from the proximal end to the distal end at 12 inches, which was about two years. So now I just want you to look as side-by-side -side comparison to slides of four patients was what we did. 
So this is the proximal end, and this is the distal end. This is two years ago. Looks a little worse. Proximal, distal, proximal. Don't like that uranium on both, distal. Proximal, distal. And I said, okay, everybody kept saying that. Come on, doc, that's ridiculous. Two years, these women, no offense, please, okay? They go two years, they blow dry, they treat it, they chemicalize it, they do all kinds of stuff to their hair. So they're destroying it and they're putting all of this stuff in it. It's got to be different. So I said, okay, let's look at this patient. Difference? Do you agree? Not agree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How about this patient? Different? Yeah. Very much so. Take a look at up here. What does this stand for? Patient five? How old's the patient? Five. Five and old. How about this patient? Patient six? She's three. Females. We don't do that to three year olds. If we do, I'm going to call the Department of Health Services on you. Then we looked at this patient. Proximal, distal, you agree? Difference? Then we even looked at 12 and 14 inches. Difference? Hey, it's a male. Now maybe he does that, I didn't get into the social history, but. So, how do we treat all of this? The things that I've noted, <clears throat> sauna baths. Why? Helps you sweat. Sweat, 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 sweat. You turn this over, it's the only way it can get out. You can get out of your system. You exhale, you sweat it, or you urinate. Does, like example, uranium goes out in the stool? It does. And you can find it, you can actually do stool samples on uranium. Uh, another thing, just as a side effect, I just got back from a convention. Physicians all over the world. <clears throat> One thing did come up um, is a new treatment for bloody noses. Hopefully, I haven't called over. I don't know if they have it. I hope they do. Um, but it's TXA. TXA is a chemical that they use to stop bleeding. It's nice. It can be used in all age groups, and it can be used in patients who are on uh, thinners. Um, Relinta, aspirin, so forth and so on. A little chemical, you get a nosebleed. We used to take and mix cocaine with lidocaine to numb you, okay? Pull it out, get you all numb, take a silver nitrate stick, stick it in there and just burn the bleeder, okay? Take it out and go, oh my gosh, right next door, we cause another bleeder. Ooh, back to it, put it in, and try to do it. If we could do that, shove a big packing in there, hold it, put you on antibiotics and send you home. Two days later, pull the packing out, and hopefully you're controlled, okay? Now we have this TXA, they take a little chemical, they mix it up, they put it in, 10 minutes, pull it out, say goodnight. So, good stuff. Came home from the conference with a, at least another treatment for you. Glutathione. Glutathione is the chemical that reverses the oxidation reaction. So, to take glutathione, it's not Orally is not good because it's chewed up in the stomach and it's not bioavailable. So <clears throat> what controls it is cysteine. It's a chemical, and this is some diet. You can take a picture of it. Uh, you can get cysteine, but it's right over the counter is N-acetylcysteine or NAC, N-A-C. You can take it. As long as you live in the area, you might take it. Now, I was also made aware and actually consulted, giving some symptomatology to a new app that is available to you, okay, called Environmental Health Tracker. It's free. It's developed by a local resident, tracks symptoms. It was launched in uh, 2017, October. Uh, 1,200 users, uh, 29,000 symptoms related have been reported. Um, and he just gave me a map of the distribution of symptomatology that they've seen uh, 
And this I like the best is that it's shareable information that you can potentially take to your physician. Okay? And I think, and I hate to even say this, I think that a lot of physicians are unaware of what is happening here. I was unaware of all of this. I had to start from scratch. This is not something that physicians get in medical school or training. So you have to read. I read and read and read and read and read. It's a self-education process, and I will say that most physicians aren't. I don't blame them, but it's just something that we're not aware of. So when I saw all of these patients come in, the first thing I said, I, I took them to my doctor. And my doctor says, well, I don't know what's going on, or you're fine, or disqualify, or whatever. Well, that's why. They just are unaware of this. They are becoming more aware. So let's look and see what's been done for the community. UCLA was first on scene when this happened, and they sent a letter out on March 19th. <clears throat> They tested the air in January during the blowout, <clears throat> January to February. They measured 25 volatile organic compounds, benzene being the one that we're referring to with that, okay? Benzene, 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 VOC. Think of that that way. Many of the VOC have toxic effects, but let's just continue to look at benzene. They also noted <clears throat> that there was particular matter that could be inhaled deeply because what they did is they went out and we're going to see what it looks like in a minute as they set canisters and you do you all know what canisters are okay and they open the canisters and the air goes into the canisters when they trapped these they didn't find a lot of VOCs but what they found is, is that there was this kind of oily residue and let's just say it right now it's a petroleum based chemical okay that's what they found in it so it was negative for VOCs and hydrogen sulfide. <clears throat> they thought that these chemicals could make their way into the home, which is logical. So if they make their way into the home, what they did is they went into the home and they decided to do dust sampling. So they went to seven unoccupied, unoccupied homes. Very important. Okay, why? because nobody's smoking a cigarette and nobody has their garage and starts their car in the morning and fills the entire home full of fumes, which has potential benzene in it, okay? And they decided to measure the countertops, the smooth countertops. They take a wipe, which we'll see a picture of in a minute, and they wipe them. They put it in a bag and they took it to a lab and they analyzed it. And the preliminary results of two of the seven homes show benzene and hexane. So what is hexane? Hexane is another chemical, it's a hydrocarbon six chain, and it causes symptoms that are very significant. It causes demyelination of your nerves. Okay? Usually peripheral, but sometimes central. So, Based on the researchers' finding, they were compelled to advise the LA County Department of Public Health, the US EPA, and Southern California Gas. The UCLA team also advised on the protocol for future uh, indoor testing directed by LA County Department of Public Health. The findings suggest the need for additional indoor testing. Okay, good. What had been going on at LA <coughs> Department of Public Health, County Public Health? They documented a few things. During the blowout, LA, DW, or excuse me, LA uh, um, uh, Department of Public Health received 700 health-related complaints between October and February of 18. 16 weeks, 44 calls a week. Post the repair, received 150 health-related calls. February 19th to March 3rd. Two a week, average 75 calls a week. A letter came out March 8th, 2016. I want you to pay attention right here. This message is intended for primary care, urgent care, internal medicine, emergency medicine provider. Where am I working? A unique clinic that has half family practice, primary care, and half urgent care. So I got this letter. 
actions requested of providers. When evaluating patients presenting with mild headache, gastrointestinal, respiratory symptoms, <clears throat> or those with other nonspecific complaint, look for alternative etiologies, which means causation, causes, other than air contamination. Avoid performing toxic tests. These are not recommended and are unlikely to provide useful data in clinical evaluation of patients. If no alternative etiology is found and there is <clears throat> concern regarding either ongoing or past environmental exposure, contact this doctor. Okay, stop please. CASPER study was initiated by the <clears throat> Los Angeles County Department of Public Health two days later after they gave that letter. Okay? CASPER study, community assessment for public health emergency response. Emergency response. They did a door-to-door -door survey, 210 household, three miles radius, not sure where they got the three miles, that's okay. Well of SS, conducted three weeks after SS was repaired. Is this really an emergency response? No. Casper study reported during the blow up. This is what they found. Note these symptoms right here. Headache, respiratory complaints, and GI. Just exactly what two days prior they told you, us as providers, not to look for. They documented it in the patients that they were talking to. And it gets worse. This is from the field. Seven interview staff reported experienced health symptoms. These are the people that went out and knocked on the doors. They got sick. Okay, now I did find something very interesting I wanted to share it with you is that exacerbation and what I underline of asthma symptoms. At this conference, I was blown away when I went and listened to these lectures talk about the United States of America now having a diagnosis in a pediatric population, that of under 18 years of age, diagnosed by pulmonologists, of 10% of our children have asthma. Now that might not shock you, but it shocks me as a treating physician. That is high. So how, if I anticipate, if that can be translated to Porter Ranch, that is significant when then we start dumping toxins and gases into the respiratory tract. And I cannot tell you the amount of kids that parents reported status asthmaticus. Status asthmaticus is, is that your child gets an asthma attack, and you go, okay, I'll give them a fulminate, I'll put them on a little decadron or a little decamethasone, <clears throat> they'll do fine, uh, maybe put them on an antibiotic plus or minus and send them out, they clear and they do fine. Asthma is, can't break them. Treat them with a pulmonate, give them a, 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 a Zopinex, um, they just go right back into it, go back into it, go back into it, three treatments, they're admitted. So we had numerous cases of uncontrollable asthma. Point of this slide, I got off a side point, is the field people have respiratory symptoms. What they told us not to look for. As well, comments from the field, headache, eye irritation, again, symptoms from the field that they told us not to look for. Their own employees have this when they went out and then they got to come out of the field. I threw this in on the CASPER study only to state 61% of the patients got their care from family doctors, which we were, and urgent cares, which gave us the foundation of seeing the patients. 40% of the households reported noticing this oily residue. Now, I don't care what you call it, black soot, dust, petroleum, oily, it's all the same thing. And in the oil, what comes from crude oil or petroleum products is benzene and other chemicals. So, the county, Department of Public Health, decides to initiate a study. Good. 
they study 114 homes. 103 homes were the study group. 11 homes were the control group. Okay? The 103 homes, very important, unoccupied, non-smoking homes within three miles of the well blowout. 11 homes were six miles southeast of blowout. These homes, to the best of my knowledge, and I tried to find it, were occupied. Now, they're well aware of UCLA's finding on March 10th, where we're going to look at this really quick because there's only two things. There's a wipe test, and then there's a canister. Okay? It's the only thing they did. Wipes and canister. Okay? And they're well aware that on the white test, they found benzene and hexane in two of the seven homes. Now, all of these agencies supposedly inputted. And I know that these people are very, very bright. A lot smarter than I am. Okay? And they're making all of the recommendations on how the study should be done. So... They come out and they farm this out to a company called Layton, and I don't know exactly what they are, and they surveyed the 114 homes, they tested numerous chemicals, and they came out with a 4,700 page document. Now, I don't want to embarrass anybody. Anybody read it? Come on, show hands. Yeah, come on, show hands. I did. Okay? No baby, no baby. But most people did not read this. But why did they put it in 4,700 pages? So you would read it. <laughs> so, I also want to know what it cost. Where'd the money come from? You. It's a taxpayer dollar. Here's a aerial map of where they tested that concentrated here and way over here this is your control area of your 11 homes so let's see what they found here's the canister they put out got the air out of your homes and here's the wipes now they wiped smooth surfaces they didn't wipe anything that had crevices because the petroleum could have precipitated out and got into the cracks they wanted smooth surfaces, which is when I looked at this. So now, we laid it out. Let's look at the chemicals first. They tested for sulfa compounds, and they tested for SVOCs. SVOCs are the semi-volatile uh, organic compounds. The blue is the air in the canister, and the orange is the white, okay? They tested for 67 chemicals, good, and they tested for 67 chemicals on the SVOCs. On the sulfa, they tested 20 in the air, and they tested for zero in the wipes. Not sure why, it's okay. Now we get to the metals. In the air, the blue, they tested for 30 metals. In the wipes, they tested for 16. The VOCs, they tested 75. Remember, VOCs are benzene. Benzene are bad. Toxic carcinogens. They tested for zero in the wipes. No VOCs were tested in the wipes. It's a molecule of concern. It's a known carcinogen. We emailed them and they said, well, because it's volatile. It means it flies away. It's like, well, well wait a minute. UCLA just told you, you had two of seven. In the wipes, didn't fly away there. Why wouldn't you test it? So let's talk about benzene. Benzene, differences of opinion in the science literature. World Martha Zagan says there is no safe level. I like that. 
It's a built-in safety net. But we, here in the United States, through the US EPA, which this is an offshoot called the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, says, no, 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 you can have benzene all the time. You just have to keep it below these levels. So they divide it up and they say, okay, chronic exposure, three. And this is all in micrograms per liter. Three, three, 27. Acute, eight hours. This is directed at your workers. And I tried to crank out this study that was about 80 pages long that now has tested Chinese workers that they came out with levels and did all these bins and I couldn't get to a conclusion, but it was very interesting. And I could never find out, well, how is it that you can be exposed to it at three micros, we'll just say micrograms per, per liter, and eight hour exposure is the same. Now, this affects your hematological system, and what they do is they take the human blood and they put it on a Petri dish, and they culture it out so it grows and replicates, and then they treat it with concentrations. And then they look at it, and they go, wow, this is abnormal, the replication. So, I never noted anything that does this do this on kilogram body weight. Does it affect and impact your children? Of course. Is the three an adult? Is a child? When you, you don't give your child a thousand milligrams of Tylenol. You basically look at the kilogram body weight before you figure out how much you're giving them. Otherwise, you kill his liver or her liver. So, what did they find in the air canisters in the homes? <clears throat> Benzene was found in greater than three, that level, by the EPA, in six out of 103 homes. It also found one in 11 was positive for benzene. We know that it causes these particular cancers. This was right from the study, okay? This is a control house. This is the level, and this is the chemical. This is 5.8, I think we'd all agree it's greater than three. Then I looked at one and found this one. This level is 29. This is greater than the one hour exposure of benzene. <clears throat> and then they sent this letter out on May 31st. As described in some report, the majority of priority chemicals, including benzene, polypsychic aromatic, known as the black soot, and sulfur compounds were not found to be elevated in the air or dust in the Porter Ranch area homes. Well, wait a second. They were found. And you never tested the sulfa on the wipes. So how can you make the statement? <laughs> In the wipes, just really quickly, 16 metals, 30 in the air. Why the difference? And you're going to see as we come up to the uranium and lithium. Two other Molecules of concern, really quick. Acrolein. Here's the levels. Keep this right here. We're going to cook now. 0 0.35. 0 0.35. Okay? 96% of the 103 tested homes were positive for acrolein greater than 0 0.35. 96%. 100% of the controls. 83%, as the gentleman asked about the schools, were tested were positive for acrolein. Acrolein comes from